Hi, time for another H8 video. So the H8 is sitting here. Um, this time I'm going to talk about this RAM board. This is an 8 megabyte RAM board using static memory this time. Um, we have places here for 16 RAM chips. AS6C 4008, very popular RAM for the 8-bit uh, vintage computing hobbyists. Uh, it's a great 512 uh, kilobyte RAM. Uh, 16 of those will put 8 megabytes on this board. Now I advertise this video as putting 16 megabytes in an H8. How do we do that? With two boards, each one having uh, 16 chips, each one being 8 megabytes. Two of them together will get us our 16 megabytes. So with this project I had actually intended to be able to put four boards in the computer and I was going to demonstrate 32 megabytes and just be completely absurd with it, but I decided First of all, uh, 16 megabytes is absurd enough, and secondly, um, due to some holidays in China, my huge pile of AS6C 4008 chips has not arrived, and this is really all of the AS6C 4008s that I could muster to make the video, so 16 megabytes it is. Um, now some of these are actually 39SF040 um, flash memories instead of AS6C4008 static RAMs. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The board can do either. The static RAMs are volatile. You cut the power, they lose their contents unless you use battery backup. The uh, flash memory is non-volatile. It will keep its memory. Uh, but it is uh, much more time consuming to program the flash because you got to program it in four kilobyte chunks and it takes a while and you got to wait. Um, so you can choose between convenience of the random access uh, reads and writes versus um, random access reads but uh, less convenient writing with the, uh, with the flash chips. Okay, let's talk about memory paging or memory mapping. So our vintage Z80 CPU or our 8080 CPU or our 8085 CPU, they all have one thing in common. They're designed to address only 64 kilobytes of memory. So you can see that in this relatively small address space down here from 0000, 000, 000 all the way up to FFFF. 64 kilobytes was actually quite a bit of memory back in the day. And, you know, your original H8 might have only come with like uh, 4 or 8 kilobytes. So if you had 64, you were probably pretty happy. But even back then, people did come up with 256 kilobyte boards. And now today we're going to do an 8 megabyte board. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to use something called memory mapping. So what we're going to do is we're going to use some page registers. Those are designated by these black arrows that will allow us to map chunks of memory to different places in the memory address space. So here you can see sort of this flat memory mapping. This would be what you get when you boot up. Your bottom chunk of memory, the first 16 kilobytes, maps to the first 16 kilobytes of the actual memory, the next 16, the next 16, and the final 16. Now to do some memory mapping, what we're going to do is we're going to adjust these page registers and let's say you want to access something out here. Well, we'll just take a couple of them. We'll move the arrows from down here up to here. And now this lower 32 kilobytes of this address space is now referring to this 32 kilobytes. And now our first 32 kilobytes of memory, instead of being mapped to 0 to uh, 32K, is now mapped up here to this uh, whatever range this is from 18,000 hex to 1 FFFF hex. And we could actually move these pointers. We could move all four of these pointers to various places around in memory. Now, we do have to be a little bit careful because our program could actually be running someplace in this space. We can't really move a pointer while we're executing code in that region of memory. So I happen to know that uh, the, the disk driver that I'm going to write is going to run up here in this block. So I'll leave this block always alone. Then I can be free to move these other blocks around. Now, what you do with all this additional memory is up to you. You could put code down here and, and start executing it. I remember back in my uh, Pascal programmer days, we used overlays a lot, and you would page in and out various sections of code, and um, you could fit more than 64K of code into that memory space. You can also use it for something like a RAM disk, which is what we're going to be doing in this video. Okay, so before I show you any schematics, let's take a look at our board at a very, very high level. So what do we have? We have our RAM. I organized the RAM into four banks of four chips each for a total of 16 chips. To address that memory, we need chip selects. For 16 chips, you'll need 16 chip selects. So 
I have some three to eight decoders. You'll see those in the schematic that for each of those will break out uh, three bits and select the appropriate chips up there. So we get all those chips selected. Then we have our page registers. Those will turn out to be 74 HCT 670 register files. And we'll have two different sets of page registers. We'll have ones for reading and one for ones for writing. You can map two different pages to the same address space. If you want to do a copy, you can take one 16K address space, you can map a read page and a write page, and you could just copy between them. So it's kind of nice having that separate. We've also got some programmable logic devices where we will implement things like addressing, we'll implement some bus control. We have an org zero, some chips for org zero. Now org zero is a heat kit feature where you would allow uh, CPM, which has to start at the address zero in the address space. So they had kind of a scheme where you'd write a value to a port and it would change the memory mapping. So instead of getting ROM at uh, address zero, you'd get RAM. That's standard, it kind of gets thrown onto every one of my boards these days. Also has the multiple side select for the floppy drive, and it's got uh, some dip switches to read some values. It's kind of a, a pile of stuff that he threw into the org zero support, so we'll duplicate that. We have a bunch of buffers, so we've got 16 address lines that need to be buffered, eight data lines that need to be buffered, and then your bus strobe, so your read strobe, your write strobe, uh, your IO read, your IO write, and then the H8 edge connector. So next up, let's take a look at some schematics. So the first page here, we have all of the bus buffers. So we've got the address buffers. Those are unidirectional. You take the address lines, you buffer them in one direction uh, to your address lines for the board. Uh, now Heathkit used inverted uh, signals on the bus. So these are inverting drivers, 74 HCT 540s. For the data lines, we're bi-directional, so here you um, you still do. This is actually inverting. It's not really shown on there, but it does invert these data lines. But there is a direction pin, this DIR pin. You can flip the direction of this either way. Um, and then it's, it's always, the output there is always enabled. So you just flip which way that data bus goes, depending on whether you're reading or writing memory. Now for the bus strobes, we've got four of those. We've got IO read, IO write, memory read, and uh, memory write. And what I've done is I've used some hex inverters, some 74 HCT 14s. Now those are Schmidt trigger inverters. So they have a uh, built-in protection against hysteresis. And I put a little resistor capacitor network here because at one point I was having some trouble with noise on my H8 bus. So I figured you do a little bit of filtering here, you get some little glitches, little pulses on that bus, these would take, take care of it. It turns out I haven't really used that. So these capacitors, I left those not populated. I did put in uh, the 100 ohm resistors, but you could probably just wire that straight across with a chunk of wire if you wanted to. Let's go look at page two. So page two has all of our RAM chips. Look at that. There's 16 of them on here. All wired up almost exactly the same way. They will have a different chip select coming out of each one because there's 16 chips. And those chip selects, they go down here into these three to eight decoders. Now over here was some of my, uh, what I was working on. I was going to put board selection jumpers in to let you put up to four boards in. I kind of screwed this up. I actually needed to or, or and these two signals together rather than putting them through. So kind of, kind of pretend I didn't make this mistake. Um, I will show you the, um, the board later and show you how to jumper them so that you can get two boards in the computer. Now the footprints I used were the 39 SF040. Uh, flash memory chip. That's kind of when I, whenever I do one of these RAM boards, I always use that footprint because it is very similar to the AS6C4008 RAM. The difference is that they swap between the two footprints. This is super annoying. I don't know why they couldn't just make it consistent, but they swap this right pin down here with an address pin. And it's actually the address pin. Let's see, I have it as... Um, pin 29. So pins 31 and 29 are swapped uh, between the SF040 and the AS6C4008. So what I do, I take those, I run them up to some jumpers. If you jumper straight across, um, then you'll be jumpering th for a 39 SF040. If you put the jumpers vertically instead of horizontally, then it will jumper this for an AS6C4008. And I put four of these jumper blocks in so that allow you to jumper each bank of four chips separately. 
So you can you can set up a board where you'll run it in like half RAM and half flash, or you could make a board that's all RAM or a board that's all flash or three fourths RAM and one fourth flash. That's that's what I'll demo in the video. Okay, here is the third page of the schematic. So here we have our two PLD devices. One of them does all the address decoding. So you've got um, your eight address bits coming in here, along with your I/O reads and writes, a few jumpers, and out of it are a bunch of select controller. It also takes in your I/O reads, writes, memory reads, writes, and it outputs some signals to turn mapping on and off. Control the direction of the 74 uh, LS640 as to whether data is going to the um, H8 bus or off of the H8 bus. Um, and it's also got in here something uh, when you're not mapping uh, those those top two bits, uh, the the A14 and A15 need to be pushed through because we won't have the mapper running that. So it, it plums a few bits through. Now we have a couple of flip-flops here that let us turn mapping on and off. And what we use is the high bit on the registers. The high bit is set to one. It gets stored here in the, the flip-flop when you, when you configure a mapping register. And that will be fed into the, um, the, the bus PLD, which will tell it to turn mapping on. Because we don't want mapping turned on when you boot up. Because when you boot up, the map registers will have uh, random values in them. And you just end up mapping uh, to random locations in, in memory. So I kind of took this scheme here from the um, Society of 8-Bit Heathkit Computers. Their, their 512K board um, had the same thing with the map enables and the same type of thing with the map registers. I kind of took that board and I just extended it to go from one, one uh, memory IC to go to 16. Um, so over here are our paging registers. So those are each um, 74 HCT670 register files. And those have separate uh, read and write um, sort of sides to the chip. So when you want to update a page register, uh, it uses A0 and A1 to know which memory cell to write into. And it writes these four bits into a memory cell. You do that on an IO write. And then on your memory read, because this is actually a read mapper, it will go in here and it will use A14 and 15. Those are the, uh, the select the 60, 16K bank in the address space. Use A14 and 15 to pull out one of those cells um, that you had written before and to put it on uh, MA14 through 17, uh, four of the address bits. So it's, it's a basic mapping scheme. If you look into the data sheet for the 670, you can kind of see how this works. But basically, we're using IO writes to set up these registers, and then we're addressing them by those A14 and A15 bits. So what we do is we take uh, four bits out of this one, three bits out of this one. So that gives us seven bits. That is enough with two of these chips to get you one within one of the banks on the board. So to get you within a two megabyte memory space um, here. And then over here, we're doing the same thing with writes because we have the register split between reads and writes. Now to go to eight megabytes, we need an additional two bits. And that's MA21 and MA22 on another set of paging registers. And then if we wanted to add the ability to have four memory boards, so to go from 8 megabytes all the way up to 32 megabytes, we'd need another two bits, which are MA23 and 24. Now we've got one final page, and this is the org zero. The org zero is kind of the, the same on every memory board I do. It's a total of uh, two different circuits here. This one here is responsible for reading dip switches. And then over here, this is uh, the other direction. When we get a strobe from IOW362, we will latch this bus data and put it out to this bus. We go through a couple of inverters here where you can either have a normal, um, normal polarity ROM disk signal or an inverted one. And the same si thing with side select. Okay, here is a close-up of the board. So you can see we have... Okay, you can see the 16 sockets for memories, and they're arranged in four banks. This is bank um, 0, bank 1, bank 2, and bank 3. Um, I have put AS6C4008 um, static memories in these, uh, the first three banks. And then I put some of the um, 39 SF040 flash chips in this, uh, this last bank. Now the jumpers have to be set. The pinout is slightly different by like two pins between the flash and the RAM. So if you notice where we've got RAM, 
we have the jumpers going horizontally. If we have flash chips, we have the jumpers going vertically, and those jumpers pair up with the banks. So this, this bank here goes with those jumpers, with that, with that, and with that. Down here, we have all of the uh, 74HCT670 paging registers. We have the LS138 sitting there. Over here is our Org Zero. If you're using like the legacy um, Heathkit board, the 8080 board where you need an Org Zero, you've got it right there. A couple of LEDs, some jumpers to configure. You've got the two PLDs, the address PLD, the bus PLD. Uh, there's some stuff down here for a battery backup that I have not even tried yet. I'm using a switching regulator here, a Polo Lu switching regulator. I use those on all my boards instead of the 7805. Um, and then you've got, you know, a few of the bus drivers and stuff like that. Looking at the back of the board, um, you can see one, one bodge wire here. Uh, this yellow one, this is just a late, late change that I realized had to be made in order to get multiple boards working. If you only want to put one board in your H8, you don't need to worry about this. I wanted to put two boards in, so I had to add that wire. I will fix that in the respin. And then, like I mentioned in the intro, I made a second board. Second board is much like the first one. I left the Org Zero stuff off because we don't need two Org Zeros. Um, other than that, it's about the same. So your board selection jumpers. Here, let me put both of them side by side. Um, and this was another little goof that I had uh, when I laid this thing out. I kind of screwed this up. I expected to be able to just use normal jumpers. But you can see for, for the first board, you have to jumper these two pins across, and then you have to jumper the middle one there down to there. And then on the second board, you just reverse that. You jumper the bottom two pins, and then the middle one goes to the top one. And that just configures the boards so that the um, the paging goes to different, uh, the banks go to different addresses. So this configuration puts these banks as zero through three. This configuration puts the banks at four through seven. Um, like I said, I will correct the yellow bodge wire and the kind of wonky jumpering on the next release and get it working with four boards for the next release. It's gonna take a little bit of a spin. Okay, let's go ahead and boot up the computer. I'm going to hit 044, which will boot from flash. There we go. So this is Compact Flash. This is the SEBC Dual Compact Flash Storage Controller. This is what I've been using before I started playing with RAM disks, and it is generally what I can boot from. Compact Flash is uh, pretty convenient. So let's go ahead and um, let's initialize some RAM disks. So I will do init. RD0 Hit return Yeah. Um, now you see a bunch of gibberish, that's because it's RAM, it's volatile, the computer is off, we turned it on, you just got whatever random bits went into there. I'm going to call this one 501, I'll give it a label of RD0. Okay, that one is initialized, no, um, and then we can mount RD0. Tip RD0 basic.abs copy over program. Oops. Dir RD0. Yep, we've got a file. Now it's only uh, 1680 sectors. That's because I have um, RD0 right now configured as a 512K disk for compatibility with the SEBHC 512K board. That by a software switch, I can switch this to turn it into a 2 megabyte disk, but it defaults to 512K so that the RAM disk driver can be used with that board without um, you know having to change any settings. Um, better to opt in than have to opt out. Um, anyhow, we've initialized RD0. Um, let me uh, H8 speed 8. I'm going to boost the speed a little bit. And then, uh, for reasons that will be obvious later, I'm going to fill drive RD1 with uh, FF uh, hex values. And this is just one quick way to initialize memory so that it's not full of that random gibberish. It actually has FF in all of these cells. It's a predictable value. will become useful later. Um, there we go. We've written all those pages. Now I'm going to init RD1. Uh, hit return when ready. See, no gibberish this time. We've got uh, FF sitting there. Um, let's hit yes. We'll call this one 501 RD1. 
Uh, now I'm also going to initialize RD2. Um, let's see, yeah, RD2. Uh, that one I have not put FF in, so it's full of gibberish. Let's call it 502 RD2. I'm going to skip over RD3 because RD3 I right now have, I have populated with fat with uh, flash chips. Uh, but let's go and we'll do RD4. Um, RD4 gibberish in it, not surprising. 504 and then let's call this RD4. And nothing more to initialize. So next I'm going to go ahead and I will sysgen RD1. Let's make RD1 bootable. Um, we actually have to go down here with say RD1. Sysgen seems a little bit buggy. And it's buggy on other devices too. Compact Flash can be weird too. Um, but we'll notice it did set up RD1 with some drivers. I'm going to rename RD1. I'm going to rename the RD driver to the HA RD1 colon. Uh, let's fix that. HA.dvd equals. Bah! There we go. RD1. So when you sysgen a drive that is different than your boot drive, it will it will swap the drivers. So SY0 is always your boot device. So what it has done is it has taken the RD driver and called it SY, and then taken the old SY driver, which was my compact flash, and named it RD. Now that's just confusing, so I'm going to change RD and turn it back into HA. Um, there we go. Now I want to uh, pip. I'm going to copy some files. Let's copy um, um, RD1 colon equals SY0 colon start. Let's copy all the ABS programs over. And then let's uh, RD1. I want to copy the adventure game over, which takes everything called advent. See, there's a DTB file and some other junk that goes with it. And I want the, the cave file, because that's what we'll need to do the adventure game later. So now, if we, let's also go ahead, we'll mount RD2, mount RD4, mount RD5. I've already set up RD5 uh, using flash chips uh, prior to this video, so I just want to show you that all of these disks are here in RD7. So, RD0. Um, do I need to mount? Let's mount RD0 first. Yeah, see it unmounted when we initialize the other disk. So, RD0 has basic sitting there. RD1 has all that stuff we just sysgen plus the files, the adventure game. RD2 is blank. RD3 is not initialized yet. We're going to initialize that flash disk later. RD4 is blank. That was a RAM disk. RD5 is a flash drive that I previously copied basic to. And RD6, same story and RD7, so I've already pre-initialized all of those drives. Now, just, just while we're sitting here, I'm going to show you how to uh, populate one of the flash drives. So, flash has to be written in four kilobyte blocks, the 39SF040 flash chip. Now, as I mentioned before, you can, instead of putting in an AS6C 4008 RAM, you can put in this 39SF040. The difference is you can't just random write it like you can with RAM. You need to erase four kilobytes and then write four kilobytes. So what I did is I wrote an RD copy tool so that we can do, we can copy uh, to RD3 from RD1 and we will just make an image copy of that RD1 that we set up as bootable. We'll copy it into RD3. Um, this will take a little while because burning flash takes time. When flash is uninitialized, you know, when you, when you get the flash chip it comes from Mauser, um, it has zero FF in all sectors. That's what an erased flash looks like. So if you remember right, I prepped RD1 to fill it with FF earlier. 
that will make burning much simpler because we don't need to reburn empty blocks. So let's go ahead. So you'll see a bunch of things that will just say same when I do this. Those are ones that are already FF on both drives. So let's copy RD1 to RD3. There we go. So you can see it's erasing and burning these, uh, these 4K blocks. And now let's mount RD3. And you'll see that when we mounted it, it says its volume is 501 and its label is RD1. That's because we did an exact bit-for-bit -bit copy from RD1 to RD3. So we now have two drives that are identical. RD1 on RAM and then RD3 on flash. Exactly the same thing, bit-for-bit -bit copy. Now let's go ahead, let's, let's do some booting. Um, I'm going to reset the computer. I will hit 081. This will boot from uh, RAM Disk 1. And you'll see it wants me to hit a space. And now we can hit the boot prompt. And here we're on RD1. It's on SY0. And it's called RD1. Now, as I said, whenever you boot, it wants your boot volume always to be named SY0. So, and it, it kind of like shuffles all the other drives. So if we mount SY1, oops, SY1 now has RD2. SY2 now has um, RD, is, is now pointing at RD3, which you remember has the bit copy of, of RD1 on it. Uh, mount SY3, it's RD4. SY4, SY5, and then if we look at SY7, it will have wrapped back around to RD0. So all of the drives are still there. Um, now, let's power the computer off, and by cutting the power, all of the RAM just evaporated. Those bits are now gone. If we power up. Oh, eight, one. Oh, it doesn't work at all. Just print a bunch of gibberish. That's because that was RAM, but oh, eight, three, the one we copied to flash, um, again, bit for bit copy. We still have to do the Autobot with the space. Let me go do that. And here we are. Now our SY0 is pointing to RD3, which has that bit-for-bit -bit copy of uh, RD1. And here we are. We can run basic. Now I also wanted to show you around the monitor. So the monitor itself has some boot commands. So you can boot R for RAM disk number three. Instead of hitting the, the control panel and there, you know, we're back at the, the space again. Okay, now let's go ahead and try this with the original Heathkit 8080 board. So I still have that sitting here. Uh, we'll pull out the Z80. This is the SEBHC Z80 board. And then we'll plug in this 8080 board. Plugs in there. Plug it in there. Power up. Now this is running the XCON 8 boot monitor which does not have any code in it for booting off of RAM disks or compact flash or anything. The only thing it'll boot off of is the H17 floppy and I do have a floppy over here. So let's go ahead and we'll do, uh, we'll push one. You can hear it making its noise there, it's loading from the floppy. Got our boot prompt. I've already loaded the RD driver on here, so we have RD sitting there. And then we can mount RD3. That has my uh, flash chips installed, so that's RAM disk number three. There are D3. Three. 
And there we go. An RD3 basic. And working as expected. Okay, so that's cool. We've got uh, 16 megabytes on the original 8080 board. I hope I can say that this is the only Heathkit 8080 uh, H8 running 16 megabytes. Right now all I'm using it for is RAM disk, but you know, you could use it for another purpose if you actually had some purpose to use uh, 16 megabytes of RAM. It's uh, banked in, so you can, you can do what you want with it. Finally, let me leave you with this boot speed comparison. Pause or you'll miss it. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.